All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Paskins, and I am the host for our, our, our marketing seminar here for the month of May for business owners and CEOs. So I am not going to go through my bio, but uh, several of you have been on uh, the previous calls, and we spent a lot of time on history bio and our why we built the shift spot. Uh, you can find that on our website as well. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into things today. And I'm going to transition over to uh, Ken Murray, our, our expert, uh, just for some of those that haven't actually been in the previous sessions, just to let you know, this is sort of the tip of the iceberg uh, for what it is we do. So during in our community, we have an expert event on a weekly basis, and we dedicate the entire month to one specific area. So this month is all marketing. Next month is all human capital. So if you haven't been able to attend these previous ones on, on marketing, if you got that on dial per se, like uh, John and some of the others that have been dialing in on these regularly, uh, feel free to join us next month because let's face it, no matter how solid marketing is, sales is, and everything else, we all have people issues and we continuously will. So it's an area that we can focus on and build upon forever. All right, Ken, with that said, why don't you go ahead and take us away, please? Will do. Thanks, Ken uh, and Winter, and great to be back for session number four in May. Uh, we wrap up next week, but um, good to see some familiar faces and, and hope to meet some new ones as well on this uh, on this session. So I'm not going to dive into my background. Either you guys know me who've been on, uh, but the main thing is really I'm focused on you. I'm focused on companies like yours, middle market, uh, really helping CEOs grasp a growth strategy and, and execute, uh, working with the, a company called Chief Outsiders. Uh, we do this for a living. I've got about 120 other peers who, who do this as well, covering um, just about any industry you can think of. Um, today, our focus is going to be all digital. Okay, So uh, we'll real briefly recap what we've covered the past couple of weeks. Uh, the session one was all about uncertainty and obviously the uncertain economy and how do I think about growth in that construct? And I think that the message was, if you don't focus on it, someone else will ultimately. And this is an opportunity for you really to leapfrog your competition. The next week, we, we did a deeper dive into marketing, what that really means, and why does it seem like it's so hard? Um, and how do we differentiate between strategy and tactics? And um, what are some things that we can do to eliminate basically the rant, what we call the random acts of marketing that so many people do unknowingly, um, but but they do them. How do you uh, do that? And then how do you, you know, think about a marketing budget? Then last week, uh, I introduced a framework that I use called uh, the growth gears, something that my company uses as well. And um, we really got into what is necessary, honestly, to ultimately execute well. You got to have the right insights, you got to build the right strategy, and you have to have a plan to execute. You need to think about marketing as an investment and a key strategic aspect of how you run your business, not just sort of a tactical thing that someone, you know, buys an ad uh, kind of thing. So anyway, this week, we're going to get into all things digital, right? Um, digital is, is an enormous category. I mean, we could spend, I'm going to run through real quickly here, kind of our outline. Um, and as I do, I'll uh, try to, uh, you know, cover the, the essential piece, which is digital is just enormous. We could spend a day on each of these topics and, and not be done. Um, and many of you, uh, you, you have to, by definition, even if you're not doing digital marketing, you're doing digital marketing, I guarantee it in one way, shape or form. And, and hopefully in this session, You'll be exposed to some new things. You'll be exposed to some sort of watch areas. Um, and, and ultimately, I want you to walk away having, you know, learned something and, and maybe take something back to your team that you can either apply, talk about, think about. And, and as I said, we're always available. Um, pick up the phone, get on a Zoom, talk about something. And I'd love for this session to be uh, as interactive as possible. Right. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments about something I've said or just you're thinking about something, just delta doubt. Don't don't worry about using the chat. Um, so let's go through some of these uh, things that we're going to cover off, you know, defining measurable goals, identifying an audience, competitive analysis, website optimization, content marketing, SEO. I'm going to cover those things. 
I'm not going to cover some of these items. It, we, a, we don't have time. B, I just don't think they're necessarily as critical as the things I'm going to cover here. Pay per click, you know, basic advertising, uh, et cetera. We're going to finish up with AI. AI is all the rage. Everyone sort of has an opinion. Um, it, it has sort of so many uses. And I want to focus its use in terms of how you can use AI to better your marketing and, and frankly, make it easier on yourself. So let's just dive into number one. Oh, sorry. Got one other thing to cover off here. Um, digital marketing is a non-starter if you don't start with this, right? With this basic, you got to be on top of security, privacy, and compliance, right? It's kind of like, you know, when you leave the office at night, you lock the door, you turn the alarm on, and you make sure you do whatever you can to make sure you're safeguarding uh, your facility and your people. And you have to do the same thing with a website or any kind of digital marketing that you're doing, frankly. And the good news is there, there's so many resources available to do this. And a lot of it is automated, but you really have to have a at least a basic knowledge of this and approach whatever you do, thinking in terms of avoiding, I think of it in terms of avoiding being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, right? Because something bad happened. Uh, we've all probably been exposed to certain things, whether it's a hack or um, some type of issue with, you know, I sent an email out and I got, you know, this note from my email service provider that says, hey, you have too many bounces. All those things sort of fit into this category and there, there are ways to, to, to do it better, right? Just like anything else. Mark, digital marketing though, this is probably the most important element. I'm not going to cover it. Just wanted to make sure uh, you guys were exposed to that thought. Yeah, just to add to that, Ken, I, I personally have experienced this. So my other business website, which no money flows through, was hacked and stolen over three years ago. Yeah. Right? And held hostage. And it was with GoDaddy. And I assume yep. that GoDaddy had it protected and everything. And they did not. So, yep. you know, if they target Folks like me with a little business where no money flows through and try to hold me hostage, you know, imagine if you've, you're you doing transactions through the through the site. So, yep. One, one of the first sites that I launched, I was lived in Europe for a few years and I built a, an e-commerce, a, a digital bank, essentially. Um, and I got hacked as well, Ken. And yeah. it was because I wasn't, it was a startup and I didn't do a great job of vetting the web host yeah. and they got customer information yeah. and, and I could have not that I would have gone to jail, <laughs> but um, it was very uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and all we all worked, we worked it all out. Um, this was 20 years ago. So I'm dating myself right at, at the much earlier phase of, you know, the internet and, and where, where things were, but it, it certainly taught me a lesson. So yeah. hopefully you guys will, will take that as well. All right. I'm not going to go into detail here. What I want this to leave with you, what I want to leave with you on this slide really is there's a lot of moving parts, right? And we've talked about that with marketing before, like, boy, there's so much stuff and so much technology and how do I get my arms around it? You don't have to worry about everything, but I wanted to, to give you an appreciation of both in terms of who kind of, and, and this is from my lens, really, like, who do I work with as a fractional CMO when I, we're talking about strategies and initiatives, and what do I need? So think of it, for those of you who were here last week when we talked about the growth gears, this is very similar, right? So um, getting the right insights uh, and, and planning to build your strategy. Well, I'm going to work with the executive team, um, budgeting and forecasting, and then I get look at um, tactically, what what do I need to to plan for project management, the team that that's going to be needed, the channels that will be used, how we're going to execute and test? Well, that's kind of like so think about this in terms of resources. I got to figure out how much the stuff costs. And do we have the right technology? Do we have the right people? And then finally, that whole measurement piece, you know, uh, if you remember um, the quote, last week around um, measurement from William Kelvin, um, figuring out um, what are the KPIs and how do we look at um, 
the the data to make sure that we're on the right page. And this this is all it's not linear by by the way. It's all you know cyclical. There's a lot of moving parts in this thing called digital marketing. But I also try to boil it down back to that word, that keyword simplicity that we reviewed in, in the first week. You know, just keep things, take a step back, keep things as simple as possible. And I've been using this slide for 12 years now. Um, and it's, I believe, the five pillars that are essential to make sure that your digital strategy is going to be effective. It's as simple as this. You got to be curious. You have to ask a lot of questions. Common theme that we've been going through uh, in the other sessions as well. Speed is essential, both in terms of the experience that you provide to, say, a visitor to your website. Things have to happen fast. Pages have to load quickly, both for them, but also for technically for Google, right? So as you are being evaluated against competition for organic search, they will totally ding you if your page paints up slowly. Um, that's a big, big issue. So speed is, is critical in many dimensions, as well as how fast can your team work, right? It's constant. It's fast. You got to get things up quickly. You have to change content. So speed, you have to think in terms of, you know, sort of hair on fire, honestly, 24-7. Um, customer experience, I don't need to go into that. You guys know this. Well, I'm um, going to just chime in right quick. Ken, Murray, we were talking to our SEO specialist um, this past week, and she was talking about how everything's going to be changing in terms of what Google determines rankings to be around this whole AI yep. kind of thing. And, and I've heard some rumblings that really Google is just going to go away unless you're some sort of type of e-commerce. And it's really all going to be about, I mean, this is eventually not immediate I mean, SEO, it, not Google <laughs> yeah yeah in terms of SEO rankings and but yep. but even searching like searching is gonna stop unless you're like specifically e-commerce um with what's happening so as far as the speed and the websites she was telling us even websites might become less relevant um with this whole new trend and they'll stop pulling data from these websites so you know it's all early stages we're about to see things completely shift like yep. for, for everyone. They, they've already done it, but I get, I have the sense that, you know, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make sure that you got to you have, you're going to have to create content somewhere, somehow, um, whether it's on your website or it's LinkedIn or, or whatever, but that's a really important point. And I think it underscores the sort of, you know, dynamic environment that, that we've been living in for, what now, 25 years at least, but it is just accelerating. It's it's crazy. Um, the the fourth one here is is kind of having a world-class mentality. It's like, and we've talked about this before. If you're not gonna try to be amazing, then don't try. It and this goes to to, to around anything in your brand. I, I firmly believe this. And it, this isn't like it's aspirational. It really is. You you kind of never get there. Um, but it's it's critical. And then the last thing is the most important thing. And this is the centerpiece, not simplicity. It's keeping things super simple. And, and you can be super simple and world-class. As a matter of fact, I think the world-class experiences that, that I appreciate are the simplest. So, all right, moving into the list, we got uh, key element number one in a B2B digital marketing strategy. It's basic, right? Define goals and objectives. And that this applies outside of digital as well, but it's really, really important in digital. Um, you know, think about things in terms of um, whether it's sales and can you attribute it back to it directly to the website or even if it's indirect. Um, customer acquisition costs, super critical. Not just how much does it cost me to acquire a customer across all my channels, but specifically within channels. And in digital, there are many, many channels to consider. Really important to, to watch your purse strings. Um, what's the website traffic? What's the engagement? Um, what are my sort of conversion goals? There's a lot of technical elements in digital as well. We just talked about page load speed. What should it be? What is it? Do I have broken links? And there's tools that you can use, very simple free tools that you can use to give you a sense of this. We'll go through that, uh, one of them in a, um, later. Where do you rank organically, right? Um, 
what are the keywords that are critical? What, what are your backlinks profile versus your competition? What's your website traffic look like? And all this can be done vis-a-vis -vis competition, right? So you can kind of say um, to yourself, am, am I doing well or am I not? And then you can set up goal, goals um, to achieve. Email, we all use email. Okay, so how big is my list? Uh, what's the open rate? What's the click rate? What's the unsubscribes? What's the bounce rate? All this stuff needs to be measured and you need to have goals against it. What's my brand engagement? Um, how are people um, engaging? How, are, how much are they spending on the site? And you can even ask them, right? You can survey them to see if your content is relevant. Some of this is qualitative. Um, oops. Um, so, you know, just understand what you're trying to, uh, what really what you're trying to measure. The next one is ideal client profile, right? Your target audience. You need to know who you're marketing to, who is actually hopefully going to be visiting your, your site. You know, is it a decision maker or is it someone who is going to influence that decision? Um, there's a, a I'm going to throw a few facts out here. The uh, this is from Gartner. The typical what they call complex B2B buyer has six to ten decision makers, right, with different needs. So probably a larger organization. But even smaller organizations have usually have more than one decision maker, right? They have people. People talk about you know a product, especially if it's going to cost some money. So you have to think about who those people are and how do I address them in the experience that we're providing, whether it's on the website or, or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, that's challenger selling metrics right there, which you know, global organizations, global accounts, the typical is 26 decision makers on every decision, so. Yep, exactly. So how do you, how do you structure that? Yeah. And by doing this, you know what, you're gonna find that these clients are more profitable versus just trying to be all things to all people. Another Gartner detail, um, 77% of B2B buyers said their last purchase was super difficult. So how do you make it easier? How do you solve that pain? How do you know what needs they have in order to make this process much easier? This is from HubSpot. We, I use HubSpot quite a bit. Firms with a strong ICP have 68% higher win rates than those that, that don't define what that is. And so forth. So there's a real good reason and to I, make sure. I consider myself an acronym guy, but I don't even know what ICP is. What's oh, sorry, ideal client profile. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Right up here. Sorry about that. Okay. Number three, competitive analysis. Again, it could apply anywhere, not just digital, but it's super important on the, in the digital world. I mean, it's kind of like the insights piece that we discussed last week in the growth gears. Um, you need to know what the competition is doing, you know, how are they positioning themselves? What's the digital experience? Because that's what your prospects are saying too. If they're shopping around, you need to you need to be prepared, right? What can you try that's working for them? What can you learn? Um, so whether it's from a you know sales process, uh, products that they have, their people, the culture, their customers, um, there's different ways of gathering this information. You know, there's paid resources, um, but it's easier, frankly, just to do web searches and then looked at uh, LinkedIn, looked at SEMrush, look at uh, Google PageSpeed Insights. We talked about, you know, some of the technical details, do some secret shopping, ask your customers, right? You got nothing to lose. Um, you wanna know what their messaging and branding is, um, you know, what resources do they have, what tools? What's their contact information like? Are they open? Are they shut? Um, all of the locations. There's a lot of competitive intelligence here, but probably the most interesting thing is, is to, to see how are they using content? Are they, you know, do they have a lot of content? Is it easily accessible? In what forms is it? Is it, do they have a blog? Do they have videos, newsletter? Um, and is it, do you think it's meaningful and relevant and, and resonating? And are you doing these types of things? So this is kind of a constant thing that, that needs to happen so that you're ensuring that you are as relevant as you can be, right? Um, social media, 
are they do they have a PR strategy? What we in old days we called PR, right? In the news. Um, what's their mobile app experience like if they have a mobile app? Um, organic ranking on keywords. Your keywords, where does your where do your competitors rank? This is really important. Well, we're gonna have a, we have an SEO page, which I'll get into why that's so important. Key element four, website optimization. This is kind of the technical side, right? But again, yes. I'm oh, sorry. Question? Okay. <laughs> no worries, but if, if you have one, bring it on. Um, so, you know, how do I make sure that the website experience is conducive to helping visitors get things done? I mean, that's why they're there. They're there to get a job done. They're not there to admire how great your website looks, right? They're not there to read every piece of content. They're there to get a job done. And so the point is that you need to think about quality versus quantity. Quantity is important. The quantity can add up in Google's eyes, right? In terms of how deep and how long and you know how long of a history do you have? That's that is important. But but quality in terms of how important and relevant is it to the visitor, Google ranks that too. Um, and the visitors will tell you based on how much time they're spending on the site and how much interaction you're getting on the site. So in terms of how it matters technically, you know, they have there's this thing called on-page SEO, and that's the relevant keywords. Are the keywords relevant to what is actually happening and what you're in business to do? Um, there's meta tagging. And I'm not going to go into all the technical details of, or definitions, but this is to give you a sense of the, the need to sort of pay attention to elements here, um, headings, URL structures, how they're laid out. Site speed we talked about. Um, is it mobile friendly, right? And again, there's easy ways to test this. The user experience in general, part of this is um, a qualitative view, like how easy is this to use? And part of it is, is quantitative as well. Content optimization, is it keyword rich? Is it relevant? And Google will tell you whether it's relevant or not. Do you have a logical structure that connects pages inside your website as well as outside, but internal linking is critical. Image optimization, you know, large images will kill website speed, right? So there are ways to compress images and making sure that uh, images are um, captioned and using uh, alt tags to ensure that Google can crawl them effectively and efficiently. Um, site maps, um, how, Google, this robots.txt and canonical tags, that, that's really basically saying how Google, when it crawls your site, will read it and what to read and what not to read, right? There, there are things you don't want it to have access to. So there are ways to make sure that um, Google doesn't make a mistake. Well, Google won't make a mistake, but you don't make a mistake, right? Making sure that any broken links or errors are are resolved. Most pages, most websites have link in, and uh, page error issues, but you can stay on top of it and and minimize. Um, so, any questions so far? I know I'm ripping through this pretty quickly. Nope, it's good stuff. Okay. Number five, content marketing. All right. So, this is kind of we're gonna think about what people who go to your website really want, right? They want to solve a problem. Like I said, they're not there necessarily to admire the cool videos that you post. Maybe they are, but most people go to a website to, to solve a problem. Um, they want to, you know, kind of make their lives easier, make it, e make it easier to do business. Um, they're looking for information. That's the vast majority of website searches. It's about research. So I'm trying to get gather information, I'm ultimately going to make um, a decision. And the experience that I have on each of the websites is going to greatly influence what I'm going to do ultimately, more so, frankly, than price. <laughs> it's really about how easy is it to deal with these people, right? I mean, just think about your own experiences and 
how difficult some things have been and how you say, I oh, would never do business with these folks. Um, basic That's product. That's interesting and because I have noticed where if it's not where I feel like connected to the, the content or the data, then I immediately get off. Like, and, and when it's so laid out, I mean, the credit card, it's gone. It, I, I mean, I make a quick purchase, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I'm a salesperson who can get sold to really fast, but if the content's not there for me, I completely check out. Yeah. I would say the content and the experience, right? Why yeah. are they making me yeah. fill this form out? Why are right. they, this you know, is taking too long. I'm out of here. I don't know how many yeah, times. It's taking too long. <laughs> out of here. See ya. Yeah. Nice try. Um, one of the things we're highlighting here, um, and I was just thinking about one of your previous segments around the different stages of like marketing, say like, you know, awareness, validation, and so forth. Yeah. And, and like in our case, um, when people go to our website, they're usually at that validation stage as opposed to awareness. So it's making me think about content that is going to serve the purpose of helping, you know, validate that we can solve their problems, um, mainly yep. because of our strategy is, is a little bit different. So we're not getting, you know, people doing, you know, SEO searches, they're already aware of us and they're validating we can solve their For problems. Sure. Yep. That's a great point, John. I think that gets to um, that, the sort of mid funnel mm -hmm. um, work that needs to be done. And you got to think about, all right, so when they're in the validation mode, what is going to help them, um, you know, ultimately make a decision. And they may they may choose to work with you or not, but what can I do to at least give them as much information as possible and in what format, right? So in the old days, we'd say, oh, download a brochure, right? Okay, fine. And a lot of companies still do that. But now it's so much more about video. Like, how, can, I, can I show you a, a, you know, a 45 second video that explains it? Or maybe something deeper if you need something deeper from a technical perspective. Um, so it all works together. But that that's a uh, that's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, something as basic as like how to contact, how to get in touch with people. I mean, how many times have you all been on a website and just saying, "I just want to talk to somebody"? Like, how do I do this? Yeah. And and some companies get it, and some companies don't. Um, doesn't mean you're not going to be successful if if you like Amazon say well you're not going to talk to anybody you know that Amazon's sort of an outlier but there's so many companies that aren't Amazon that I think would do a great service to themselves and build their business better if they did a much better job of getting you the information you need maybe even talking to a human being that's um, one of my like immediate frustrations is when I want to contact somebody and all they have is the web form for you to give them your information. Yep. So it's so, frustrating. And but but and I, I have this in the content marketing category. I mean, it could be anywhere, but I think it's I think it's critical content because you are in, trying to engage. And isn't that what a brand ultimately wants to do is to have people engage? So why make it so hard? <laughs> and on the contact page for my websites in the past couple of years, I've always put we're real people, you know, let's talk. Yeah. And, yeah. and I have all of our information there, right? Yep. Because it's like people want to know they're dealing with real people, especially exactly. in this new AI world that we're about to head into. Everybody's yep. going to be a robot doing the contact yeah. us pages totally. and stuff. So. Totally. Yep. Personalization is, an, is important. On a general website, it's difficult to personalize an experience um, to an individual, except now that there's there's a new tech, fairly new technology called CDP, it's customer data platform. And it can use first and third party data to help better identify a customer, especially someone who's been back, who's been to the site more than one time. So that is incredibly relevant as you really start to engage with the brand to, to see that they recognize you um, and that they are starting to paint up an experience that tailors you and your needs, right? You're much more likely to continue that work versus something that's just completely generic. Um, and the other thing that people want, obviously, is to save time and money. No one wants to spend a lot of time on a website and to the extent that they can save money and you are selling something, talk about it, right? There's uh, 
different places to do this, your website, your LinkedIn page, Facebook, email, TikTok, Instagram, mobile apps. The, the thing is not to just think of limit it to your website um, or limit it to whatever is your most effective digital channel, but it really kind of needs to be ubiquitous and, and cycles through. Just, just out of curiosity, and I'm sure John is thinking this and Scott is sitting thinking this and others I know think this all the time. Where the hell do you choose? And where do you invest? Because this is, this is like, do everything. And I'm being sarcastic, right? But, you know, how, how does a business choose and how do they choose where to invest? Or are you saying you must do these out of curiosity? Uh, no, no, I'm not saying you must. As a matter of fact, I mean, mm -hmm. I, so I've done a lot of uh, business with micro businesses. They don't have websites. They use Facebook, right? It's free. It's easy. It's where they, their audience uses it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying you need to choose one over the other. You need to choose the channels that are effective. You probably need to test into them. Um, most companies don't have a mobile app. Most companies don't need a mobile app. But mm -hmm. to the extent that you do, make sure the experience, make sure you're thinking about the stuff on the left-hand side as you're providing content and experiences, uh, regardless of regardless of the channel. That's interesting you put that, Scott. So your clients dictate which ones to choose. Do you mind, do you mind elaborating what that means? They How do they dictate to you what to choose out of curiosity? Well, it goes to the ideal customer profile idea. If you know who that is, yeah. our, our clients like are CEOs, so they don't hang out on Facebook much yeah. or at all. Yeah. They don't hang out on, I mean, they might consume some content on TikTok, but uh, primarily they're going to be on LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. a lot of garbage on LinkedIn these days. It's it's insane. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll see to follow Scott's point of you know where your ideal customer is going to be, but also where do they go for when they're trying to solve a problem, right? Because let's say there's maybe CEOs who do spend time on Facebook for their personal time, but when they have a business challenge, are they looking through Facebook for solutions, or are they looking on LinkedIn? Yeah, and what I'll add to that, um, John and Scott. So one of the things that, that I typically do uh, when I do what I call voice of customer work is I will ask that question. I'll make sure I understand. It's, it's kind of like a media consumption category. Like, OK, where do you go for information? And it could be offline. It could be online. Most of it's online now. And I want very specific details. OK, um, which. Uh, websites, which, uh, you know, I'll call them periodicals, what, which research are you consuming? How are you consuming it? Because that then adds to and can be bolted onto the, you know, Scott's point around the ideal customer profile. And then you can start to figure out, you can just ask them a question. Do you use Facebook, you know, professionally? No, I don't. Or yes, I do. And, and then you can really start to test into some of these channels. But you, it gets way, way back on day one of our sessions. Uh, being curious and asking a lot of questions. All right, let's move on to the strategy questions that you should be asking as you're building out your content, right? So these aren't questions necessarily that visitors or customers are going to ask you, but that they should leave with an answer kind of. Like they should have a sense of how is XYZ company the best. Ultimately, you're getting to the point where why am I, why am I, as I'm making my decision, why should I choose you, right? How are you different? How can you differentiate yourselves? What makes you stand out, right? What makes you important? Um, is there anything you can share that I'm going to find helpful, useful? Um, processes, uh, experiences, tools? Who are you? I want to know more about your brand. Right. Tell me about your people. People is what make a company. People is kind of what makes everything work. So I want to figure out if I want to work with you. This one is super critical. There are more and more consumers and businesses making decisions based on what a company stands for. I mean, we're not going to again, not going to go into the headlines, but there's lots of examples of this. Uh, good, bad, and ugly, where companies are, 
you know, making interesting decisions, either going in a certain direction or not going in any direction. And consumers are going to are making decisions about do I want to work with these people or not based on what they stand for. And it's important to stand for what you st to, to stick with what you stand for. Right. If you're going to be political, be political and do it with a bang, but stick with it. If you're not going to be, then stand for something. Anyway, people are making decisions on this. You know, what are your stories as a company? Important, but less important than what's the customer story? How does the customer fit into the picture? And if you remember, we talked about building a story brand um, where the customer is the hero, uh, the Donald Miller book that I highly recommend. That's where this fits in. People want to see where they fit into your brand. How can I be a part of this? And is this, do I relate? Can I relate? I'll say okay. to that book this weekend. What, what, Pardon? I missed the name. What was the name of the book, please? Building, hang on, building a story brand. I don't know if you're looking oh, at the camera man. or not, but uh, yeah, Don great Miller, book. Great like 15 book. bucks on, um, on Amazon. It's a quick read. All right, so awesome. everybody's read it but me. I'm sure Winter's read it, so I should get it. So we'll try. <laughs> no, no, I have it. You can yeah, read mine. I'm surprised. You can read. You can read it to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it a few times. I, I do love story brands. Okay. Okay. Let's go into SEO. We talked about SEO a little bit. Look, this is a longer term strategy. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to do SEO and see immediate results um, in my organic um, listings. This, this is something that requires structure. It requires um, constant nurturing. And it is difficult. Uh, if, if you all have tried, I'm sure you all have tried it in one form or another, but it is so critical. And at the end of the day, I mean, you could think of it as being free, right? These are, these are free, the free business, if you will, as, as business, you know, sort of cycles through an organic listing onto a website or ends up in a phone call, however it does. Um, you know, Google makes 90% of its money through paid ads, right? But they pay more attention to organic listings and all the technical details that we started that we reviewed a few slides ago. Um, it is probably the most important thing. Now, AI may change this, but as we sit here today, in terms of how do I show up when someone is doing a search? Because that is 90% of the activity on Google is, I am searching for something. I am looking for information. Whatever you do, it's got to be data driven, not sort of randomly. Hmm, I think I'll put up a video because it'll help my SEO results. No, it's everything in SEO and organic listing is data driven. There's a lot of data on ROI and conversions. Three times better conversion rate than paid ads, right? People, do they click on paid ads? Obviously, they do. Google's making a lot of money. But when they click on an organic listing, you have three times higher conversion rate. A lot of people don't believe what they see in an ad. They don't think it's legit. That's part of the issue. Cost less, obviously, generates more leads. More than half of B2B prospects get news. I think this is this is all the stuff from Google. I actually think it's this is understated. Get news from digital channels, meaning not exclusively, but primarily, right? Do I watch? Fox News or CNN, yes, I do, but I get most of it from digital. Oh, and by the way, Fox News and CNN are digital as well. So websites with blogs get 126% more leads than those without blogs. So that is part of a, this is a tactic, right, within the organic framework. Um, and it's all about content and the right kind of content, how deep it is. 126% more leads. If I could just add to this, I don't know if any of you have experience with SEO. So I'm a believer. So Ken and I will keep the company out of it, but we worked at a joint company together actually a couple of years back. And uh, the the person that was there, uh, she's a mad scientist. I'm happy to connect any of you with her, but she did phenomenal stuff. And I hired her at my other company. And uh, the results have been just 
incredible. Uh, and I will tell you that there's a lot of SEO pretenders out there, <laughs> right? You know, um, and then there is this group of mad scientists, but if you apply it right, it is a long gain. I mean, it took a good 12 months for us to actually see that gain, but the, the gain is, uh, it's been well worth it to be quite honest. For sure. And, and there are great tools to measure that gain. Uh, but the point is just to make sure that it's a constant part of your rotation, right? You, you really can't set it and forget it. SEO rules change very frequently. Google's search algorithms change frequently. No one really knows what's in it. But if you're working with someone like uh, Ken's agency, they're on top of it and can react very quickly to make sure that, that you stay in the forefront. Um, more, more data. You're six times more likely to get lead conversions using content through SEO than an ad. It lasts forever too, right? So it's, it's sort of evergreen. That doesn't mean you don't change it. It's actually really good practice to change your content frequently. But once you've established it, unless you take it down, I mean, it's out there. And it can be, it can generate value for a long, long time. All right. Yeah, I know with um, Ken Paskins, he did something for GCE that's old. Tell, tell him about that, Ken, um, where it's like the number one ranking blog that keeps, that Viola keeps saying like, this one hit it out of the park again. This one hit it and it's old, Yeah, but it just keeps nailing it. Well, and they keep fine tuning it with new data, new dates. It's just, it's kind of bizarre how you can reutilize the content over and over and over to generate business. So, yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. We're coming into the home stretch here. We've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to finish with two things. Uh, marketing automation tools. Um, this is kind of a, a basic thing. I, I, I put some tools out here on the right side that, that I used or, or use. Um, there, there are literally, you know, tens of thousands of tools out there. Um, this is a small fraction of of that set um and it's kind of like if you remember the growth gears segment from last week um you know in the execution gear that last gear there's an element around resources okay and marketing automation kind of fits all of the aspects of the resource uh component in terms of okay technology clearly this is all technology right um people I got to have people to run this stuff or someone, an agency, um, got to you know, figure it out. It doesn't just run on its own. And then the third thing is, well, it does, most of these aren't free, right? So clearly in that hub of, um, of execution and resources. Um, it's really, I guess the best simple definition is how to get more done faster, more consistently. Right. So automating processes. So thinking about email and I'll go to through a list of here, sort of the basic one on ones. You know, we've all heard about CRM systems. Salesforce is the the leading provider of that, although, you know, others compete and you know, th this whole industry is sort of consolidating um, email marketing platforms. Uh, HubSpot used to be only an e email marketing platform. They now call themselves a CRM. There's a lot of crossover. MailChimp is uh, a company that a lot of my clients use uh, with, with good effect. Um, marketing automation software, kind of HubSpot evolved into that before they moved into CRM. Content management systems. Uh, WordPress is probably the most commonly known um, content management system. Really just how do I get my content out there? It's kind of hosting the website, analytics and reporting tools. Um, you've got um, Looker is probably Google Looker is, is a really good tool now that I've used recently. Social media management, um, Hootsuite and uh, Sprinkler are, are two that, that pop up. SEO tools we've talked about, Bright Edge is a great, great tool. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, Viola uses, but but I've used Bright Edge a few times and uh, has really helped out. PPC, you know, Google, what used to be AdWords, um, so many, you know, different platforms where you can buy 
ads and manage them. Connected TV is a relatively new um, entrant. Mountain, this is uh, one of Ryan, Ryan Reynolds' companies uh, that he's invested in. So this essentially allows you to buy television advertising for people who've cut the cord, right? So this isn't for cable. Un sort of, you know, streaming TV is now over 50% of the audience and 50% of over 50% of households. Uh, so think of like YouTube TV. I, I'm a YouTube TV user. I cut my spectrum cord about two years ago. Yeah. And what Mountain can do is it can find me, right? It's advertising to me as an individual. It's not advertising to um, me as one of, you know, a million people who might be watching Jeopardy at a certain point in time. That's uh, how you buy the persona that you are through Mountain and served up through YouTube TV. You you buy Ken Paskins, and I know Ken, Ken Paskins has a tendency to watch, you know, I can tell he's online, right? Yeah. He's plugged into Google through YouTube TV. There's this big connection. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I also know his search history, right? So I know what to, I can't personalize the ad yet. They're, they're going to get to that. But I can serve up the right ad based on who I know Ken Paskins is. And I know it's not Ken Paskins. It's, you know, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. It's, it's, you, you are identified as an object. And then I can provide that feedback back to the customer, not as Ken Paskins, but as a person that fits into that, you know, sort of persona. It's, it's really pretty wild. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, customer data platform. I've used Acquia. Um, they're kind of a leader here. This is, gathering all the intelligence that you know about a customer or a prospect, uh, first party and third party data, and then you know, sprinkling it, using it, spreading it out through your other marketing automation tools um, with effect. Social listening, you know, what are people doing on social media platforms? Sprinkler is probably the leading tool there. Uh, conversion rate optimization. So think about you know, A-B testing, multivariate testing, how do I test different versions of a website? VMO is a great, um, is, is a great resource so, so optimizedly. There, there's so many companies in, in each of these sort of categories. Um, and we at Chief Outsiders, we've probably deployed HubSpot at more companies than any of the other tools, because a lot of companies just don't have that maturity yet. And this is a Pretty easy tool to use, can get expensive the more and more contacts you have to, to process and manage, but it really is um, pretty effective for mid-market mid companies. I would highly recommend it if you're not um, you know, doing anything. All right, let's see. I've got one more, marketing attribution. Yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. Marketing attribution really is a difficult category. There's one, Kachava is, I've not used Kachava, um, but I've done a lot of research on it. And um, they claim to be able to really tease out all the different channels effectively, even if you have a you know significant omni-channel approach to get to a pretty finite number in terms of how much each customer acquisition cost is by channel. Um, you know, the, the Typical attribution is this sort of last click model. What did a customer do the last, what was the last action that the customer took? And I'm going to give credit there. That's not accurate. Um, but Kachava, you know, through its interconnectivity and, and mountain to a degree because it's, um, whoops, sorry about that, because it's connected in through Google can really help with that. So, so we're getting better and better in terms of being able to measure. Um, the attribution. Okay, home stretch here. Uh, Ten minutes. Message here for AI is get on board. If you are not already, the train has left the station. And um, you know, there, there's a couple of. I'm going to focus really here on the large language models that we've been reading about. You know, ChatGPT through um, through a company called OpenAI that Microsoft has invested in 10 billion in. Uh, probably the best investment that they'll ever have made um, because you know, OpenAI could be a trillion dollar company at some point. We'll see. But 
Um, the other player, major player in the large uh, language models is Google. You know, who knew? Google Bard. It's still kind of in beta. They're a bit behind the curve. Um, OpenAI is clearly the leader. Chat GPT is the fastest adoption of technology in history. Um, I, I was reading a couple of weeks ago, 100 million users. I, it's probably 500 million now, I don't know. But just, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you guys have used it to a degree sort of with interest, right? Um, there are now, I say hundreds, there's probably thousands, tens of thousands of additional tools and products. You can plug in chat GPT to just about anything. I plugged it into Excel. From um, you can write so many different queries. It makes it's like super easy to do any type of like coding. It's not even really coding because you don't have to do any coding. You just write. You know, you just give it a basic text prompt and it delivers something for you. Now, there's a big heavy asterisk here is that it's not always right. Um, you know, I. I, I asked ChatGPT to write a bio of me um, just to test it out. I'm like, oh, cool, this is really, and I liked it. It said, it, I'd say it's about 75% right. But from an education standpoint, it said I got um, an MBA at Wharton. And um, I didn't, but I'll take it, right? <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna publish it. I, I I'm a Florida Gator. I got my MBA in Florida. I went where I could afford. Um, I couldn't have, at the time. I couldn't afford Wharton. Not that I applied. But um, anyway, you got to be careful with with this. And and you should never publish anything immediately. It really should be used as a tool. So let's go through some of the things uh, that I want to focus on in terms of content marketing. Right. So that's get rid really of that. Fun. What's true and what's not true? Because I, I've done the same thing, and it. Yeah. Added three years to my age. I was born in the Midwest, but um, I've already retired and I am a, a multi, multi-millionaire in philanthropist. And, and, and I just spend money helping kids or spend time and money helping kids. I wish I could, but I don't, right? So, but how do you actually, how do you actually check the, and uh, that data? Because there's going to be a lot of marketers and a lot of people that are going to, Plug that in and go, it must be true, right? And push it out yeah. there. Is there a way to check that? I think that's the biggest question mark for OpenAI is to get that next level of validation. And I mean, the, the advice that I'm giving is um, never publish something that you that is produced on chat GPT. It really should be used in terms of like an outline should be used in terms of basic research. Uh, anything, anytime a fact is mentioned, it really should be double checked against another source, right? Most people, I'm guessing, are not going to do that. Um, but if you're if you're going out and publishing something on the web, you really need to be careful. Um, and I'm going to guess that the search engine algorithms are going to start picking up on this and ding you for having content that is, you know, machine generated that hasn't been validated. They'll ding you in terms of this, what they can do, which is search engine results, Yeah, right? Exactly. They're gonna push you down. So uh, that's that's probably the biggest question out there, Ken. Okay. So real quickly, uh, the basics, what can you do? Obviously benefits and risks to whatever business you're in. First drafts are great, right? Um, or you can plug in a first draft and get some content. Hey, can you edit this? Content revisions, just some suggestions um, in, in many different languages or contexts or voices, right? I want to speak, you know, uh, as if, you know, I want to speak to the English speaking person who's a native of Finland. I don't know. You can say that and would write it differently. Um, obviously, better website and digital content. Uh, looking cross channel because you need to write differently for the different channels. Right. Facebook is different than LinkedIn. It's different than a website. It's different than TikTok. TikTok's video. But in terms of how you would you know, mention that, how, right. how you would, um, you know, create a script. Mid funnel ebooks, John, we were talking about, you know, your mid funnel visitors who are trying to get more information. Well, 
this is a great tool to help write that draft of for the person who's in that process. Um, it can write code. I I need a calculator, a mortgage, simple example, need a mortgage, 30 year mortgage calculator, blah, blah, blah. Here's the code, take the snippet, build your, build your site. Some key questions to ask, right? What are the risks or benefits of X? It could be a new product you're entering. It could be a new territory you wanna go into. What keywords are used in search for this product or this geography, et cetera? What homepage tagline should I use for, I wanna get into this business or I'm in my own business? Um, what's the ROI? This is a really interesting one, right? If I get, if I get into this, category, the subcategory that I'm not currently in, what should I anticipate? Again, should you take this information to the bank? No, it's it's a piece of information. It's a piece of research. I took my bio to the bank. It did not help. <laughs> well, I am and, a and, wealthy um, philanthropist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to um, just give a website that I learned about last week that has amazing prompts to put in chat GBT because it's not about the, the AI, it's about the prompts, right? And it's called SAAS prompts. It's sasprompts.com. And it literally goes through and tells you like, I am an SEO expert. Tell me the meta tags to use for blank, whatever it is you're putting in there, right? So the, the prompts yep. on this site, I, I were like, I, my, my mind isn't there yet to realize that I need to start thinking of how to prompt better, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I'll just throw that little tip in there. And by the way, yeah. I think that's the old SaaS companies that, that's privately owned out of the Carolinas that's been around for decades and decades and stalled out that now I think they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I know the uh, CIO at SaaS. Yeah. Really interesting company. Yeah. So how they went from like, to, you know, that to that. Hmm. Well, follow up with um, Winner and Ken about those prompts. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that this type of you know AI or you know Chat GPT specifically, you know, it's a tool, but like definitely leveraging professionals to leverage a tool to know what questions, what prompts to ask, but also to double check it. The example I'll give is um, we've started leveraging with our developers in which it can write the structure of code, but we need developers to review it to make sure it's actually be functional because we have caught mistakes that it's made, but it accelerates work. Yeah. So all our developers have to do is just double check it or yeah. correct some mistakes. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I mean, I like it that I would liken it to being, you know, you move from being a newspaper reporter, right? I have to go out, find the story, get it, write it, to the editor, copy editor, who looks at it and says, makes okay, I can, I can, it's gonna take me an hour to write a story. It's gonna take me 10 minutes to edit it to make it better. Yeah. Right. So they're basically copy editors. Really important job. Right. Probably get paid more, frankly, because you're, this is about quality. Um, but yeah, it, it greatly can impact efficiency. OK, I realize we are at time just real quickly. How do I get people to do something? What are the relevant social media topics in certain type of, you know, Product. What email topics do people care about? Write me an ebook or a webinar outline for X topic. Code a submission form on you know a web page. Write questions. I'm going to have my sales call you know next week with a prospect I've been chasing for for months. Help me write some questions for this product or for this company. Like what would this person or even this person to the extent that they can you know, talk about Ken's philanthropy and, and investment and caring about children, right? Bring that up in a, in a sales call. Yeah, see how far you get now. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was going to go through an exercise, but I realized we're at time. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to hand it right back to uh, Ken and Winter to close us out. Yeah. We can close it on up. You guys know where to find us. Find us shiftspot.com. And uh, next week is the last event with our awesome, awesome expert. Ken, I love how this content has not been buildable, meaning you can get value if you didn't attend all of them, but they really do sort of like play on one another. And it does just seem to get better and better and better. And 
Um, next, next week is going to be discovering unco uncovering the power of your brand. Last one, um, it's going to be right after the holiday. So we might be light, but, um, you know, it's been awesome. So we really appreciate you guys showing up and you'll get the follow-up from me as per usual. And we thank everybody. Yep. All right. Thanks all. Have a great Memorial. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.